Hi there, friends. I'm Alex Olshansky. Welcome to Deep Fix. The following is a conversation with Gregory David Roberts. Greg is the international best-selling author of Shantaram. He is also the author of Shantaram's sequel, The Mountain Shadow, as well as his latest book, The Spiritual Path. Today, Greg lives in Jamaica, where he is channeling his remarkable creative energy into making all sorts of wonderful music. One of Shantaram's many millions of fans worldwide is Apple CEO Tim Cook. Under the Apple TV banner, Shantaram has now been adapted into a major TV series. This is a film project that was in development for many years and now is accessible to watch. It debuted in October of 2022. So this conversation was originally recorded at Greg's home earlier that year in January. It was recorded while we sat outside his very tropical home, one stone's throw from the White Sand Beach. I didn't publish the conversation until later in the year to coincide with the official TV release of Shantaram. And I'm now republishing our conversation, which was truly the first podcast interview I've ever done, to coincide with the official launch of my podcast, Deep Fix. You might be wondering, how the hell did I end up at Greg's home in Jamaica? Well, in 2021, I wrote an essay about Shantaram and Greg's impact on my life. How his work helped me when I was both in my addiction and then in my recovery when I was building my writing career. I sent that essay to Greg through a portal on his website and it landed in the hands of his team. And then through a few twists of fate and most certainly some dumb luck, I ended up developing a relationship with him and had the opportunity to be mentored on my own writing path and career. So in January of 2022, Greg invited me to spend a week at his home in Jamaica, which to say the least was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. The conversation that you are about to listen to is massive. I've already had countless people reach out to me saying how much it impacted them. And we cover everything from Greg's utterly fascinating life reaching a turning point in addiction, writing, spirituality, gangster tantra, quantum physics, ethical business practices, and much, much more. If you'd like to support the editing, music production, and labor of love that go into making this, please subscribe on Substack for just $6 a month. There you'll get access to exclusive audio and literary content, and you'll also be supporting my work and career as an independent writer, thinker, and now podcaster. There are a million places you can spend your time today, a few of which are even worthwhile. But no matter, I'm grateful to be one of the million, and I'm hopeful to be one of your few. Without further ado, I give you Gregory David Roberts. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Deep Fix. Fair warning, today you might hear some birds chirping, some motorbikes revving, because I'm sitting here, or maybe even a a car honk, because I'm sitting here at the lovely house of my guest today, Gregory David Roberts in beautiful Jamaica. Greg, so good to be here. Thank you. I'm very glad you're here. It's safe to say you've lived one of the most extraordinary lives ever, or at least as far as I know. You're a writer, a music producer, an artist. You've been known as the gentleman bandit, the gangster Shakespeare, my personal favorite, the author of Shantaram, the best-selling book, which is being turned into a TV series made by Apple, starring Charlie Hunnam of Sons of Anarchy. Very much looking forward to that coming out later this year, whenever it does. And so there's going to be some folks who are quite familiar with your story, most who aren't. And instead of doing the typical, having you just rehash your life story, which is now stuff of legend all over the internet you can find. I'd like to drop in right away with a deep question. Is that all right? Please go right ahead. So when I was going through one of the hardest points of my life after reading Shantaram, I came off a very obscure blog post. I'm not even sure where I found on the internet where you wrote about reaching a turning point. So I'm wondering what is a turning point and how might one reach it? Good question. I think I guess I'll deal with reaching the turning point first before uh, dealing with what it is in a way from my perspective. And let me just say from the get-go that I'm just a person. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a leader of any kind. 
I'm not um, an expert in anything except perhaps catastrophic failures um, and flaws of character and maybe how to survive and keep going. That's probably the only expertise I have. I, I love my art, I write, I make music and so on, but I'm not an expert in anything and anything I say is just from my experience and I'm not trying to tell anyone else how they think or what they should think. It's just my, my feeling and my experience my life. So about the turning point, I wish that I could say that I worked hard to reach a turning point, but I didn't. Um, there's an old saying that the universe taps you on the shoulder when it wants to tell you to change direction. If you ignore that, it gives you a big shove. And if you ignore that, it hits you over the head with a piece of two by four. In my case, the two by four was two years in solitary confinement. And uh, when I was put into solitary for two years, I spent the first year doing what I think a lot of people do, I, I don't know, moaning and whinging about my terrible fate and troubling deaf heaven with my bootless cries and so on. But then there was the turning point, which was m midnight on New Year's Eve. And in that solitary cell, I could hear two levels of celebration. The prisoners in the wider community of the prison who were free to bang their doors and celebrate something and say, well, that's another year finished on our sentence. And they were all going off in their cells. And then there was the wider sounds you could hear from the community outside. You'd hear fireworks and car horns and people shouting and dancing and music and so on. And when you've just done one year in solitary, for anyone who doesn't know, the first year gives you a, a metric you just knocked out a year in solitary, so you know what every year from that point onwards is going to be like. So I knew the year in front of me, I knew I had to do two years in solitary, so I knew what the next year would look like and what it would feel like and had a very clear view of it. And it, it just occurred to me at that moment at midnight, in a, I guess a blinding flash really, uh, I have to change the direction of my life. I have to shape my destiny from this point forward. And the expression of that turning point was January 1st when the guard opened the door in the morning. It happened to be shower day, so you could go and take a shower. And he opened the door to escort me to the, the solitary confinement shower down the corridor. And I said, good morning, happy new year, <laughs> which I had not ever said good morning or any other kind of positive greeting to the guard in a year the first year of solitary. Wow. And that was my turning point, really. That was the physical expression of a turning point that happened in my mind. So I, you know, I can't claim any credit because I had to get whacked on the head by sol solitary confinement to reach it. But I'm very, very, very glad that I did. It was one of the best things that happened to me. I really needed it at the time. I think even the system needed two years for me to be in a box for a while. I can't say that for any other person. Of course not. But for me, it was tremendously beneficial. And I emerged from solitary with a much, much clearer understanding of my, my flaws, my weaknesses. It's that moment of looking at yourself and saying, wow, every bad thing I might have blamed on someone else or fate or destiny or even the upbringing I had, it was me the whole time. It was me. I could have done something different. And now I'm going to. I'm going to change the course of my life. And that was my turning point. Now, the second part of your question, and I don't want to take too much of your time out of this before you get, was what is a turning point? And I think the turning point itself varies from the situation that you're in. If you have experienced a very lengthy period of depression, the turning point for you will be different to the turning point you may have as an alcoholic attending a meeting and saying, I need to stop this. Going with a friend and say, I, I, you've got to help me get there. I need to stop. I think they're different turning points. I think the turning point for heroin is a very different one. Uh, anyone who has a heroin addicted family member out there, anybody who is a heroin addict, I was a terrible heroin addict. I was such a bad addict that I robbed banks. So, Anyone who has a heroin addict in their family should know that heroin is a very unusual drug. It has a turning point that, for instance, alcohol and nicotine don't. People smoke and drink into their 90s if it, if it isn't killing them already. 
whereas there are very, very few 90-year-old heroin addicts. Yeah. It's a, there are very few 70-year-old, 65-year-old, 60-year-old, even 55-year-old heroin addicts. There's a turning point for heroin around, if people live that long, there's a turning point of around 40 to 45, and most addicts, if given the opportunity, will change at that point if they have not before. So this is a great message for family members. Hold on. All you have to do is make sure that that family member stays alive. They will reach a turning point with heroin that they might not reach with alcohol or cigarettes. So the turning point itself it is going to be different depending on the situation you're in. If you're suffering from severe traumatic stress and you suddenly reach a turning point in your life where it doesn't trouble you anymore, you can't say suddenly because that turning point may involve years of therapy and years of analysis and help and support to get you to the point where you say, that does not trouble me anymore, it does not disturb my life anymore, I've reached a turning point. So they're all going to be different, and each one of us is a unique individual, thank God, each of us is unique, and we have unique experiences and so on. I think the collective aspect with the turning point is that it's a global change in everything that you've ever done before. It often involves the subtraction, if I can say that without a negative uh, context, of people who were involved in a circle of friendship before. The circle of friendship around your heroin addiction, if you reach a turning point, you'll find that very quickly none of those people who were in that circle, who are still in that circle, are in your new circle of life and acquaintance. Things like this are, are very big changes that are part of it. So it's global changes in direction, in thought, in perception of self, in the circumstances in which you live, and so forth. So all of those are, I think, variable changes. I love what you said about the universe providing a turning point for you and the way you phrased it. I actually once wrote a piece about how there are feather, brick, and then dump truck moments where at first you might just get a little nudge, then a eventually you're going to get hit with the dump truck coming to really take you out. And those are 10, hopefully people can reach a turning point before having something as impactful as that happened. Sure. And just, you know, a little adjustment on what you said before. It was not the universe tapping me on the shoulder or, or throwing me in solitary. It was me. Yeah. <laughs> Flaws in my character, my own weaknesses. It was basically stupidity, my own stupidity tapping me on the shoulder and saying, wake up, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate the the personal accountability that you take there because I think that often can be, so it's something that can be lost on folks where Yes, there are cultural forces at work, but at the end of the day, we do need to, the change can only happen from within. And so I, I very much appreciate you acknowledging that. And so you mentioned that you were doing heroin. You mentioned that you robbed banks. I have for some of you all who might be wondering, myself included, how did you end up in solitary in the first place? Well, I was sentenced to 10 years for the armed robberies that I did with the toy gun. And, of course, there's no excuse. The people I robbed didn't know it was a toy gun. They were just as fearful as if it was a real gun. And that's the sin in what I did. It was putting fear into innocent people. Their psychic vibrations were, were so severely disturbed by that. I was too young, too stupid, and too addicted, too weak, really, to know that this is a really violent thing you're doing to another person, putting that much fear into them. And they called me the gentleman bandit because I used to apologize and never took a whole lot of money. I only took enough. I'd say, that's enough. I don't need more money. I'm a heroin addict. But the thing is, I put fear into people. I was sentenced to do, I had to do 10 straight years in prison. I did two and a half. And for a variety of reasons, I decided to leave before my you know, required departure time from the prison. So I escaped over the front wall at one o'clock in the afternoon between two gun towers. It was the <laughs> only place on the wall, it was the only place in the prison that was not being observed because no one thought, they thought that no one would be crazy enough to try to escape over the front wall in, in, in the middle of the day and next to the main gate. But uh, we did, two of us escaped and I spent 10 years on the run and um, you know had a lot of different experiences and adventures and was eventually recaptured in Germany and was caught on a smuggling run, then put into a German prison and fought extradition for 19 months in order to win certain concessions from the Australian government. So, the, And I tell anybody out there, you know, the law is an instrument. Um, you know, it can be an instrument of oppression, and it can also be an instrument of liberation. 
And by struggling and fighting, by putting my, my head down and learning to read and write German, studying the law, applying myself, and then um, struggling for 19 months, I saved myself the five years I would have had to do for the escape. So I was returned to Australia and eventually, and as a punishment for escaping, put into solitary for two years. So that's how I ended up in the box. And one of the things that I appreciate from getting to know you, Greg, is an awareness of, you mentioned the personal accountability, owning mm -hmm. up to your own, what you said were character failings and such. But then there's also an awareness of the, the system of actually, and it's very hard, I think, for myself and probably many others to imagine being incarcerated and have being captured and then being in another country and fighting a legal battle of extradition. And yet here you are, this man today who's making music and there's this just full expression of creativity coming from, it feels like every ounce of your being. We'll get to the music, but what I'm curious is how did this writing career where did that come from? And how did some of the, how did some of that experience of being incarcerated shape your, your writing? It's a good question, a long one. And there's a, another one buried in your question there that we may get to a bit later on. And that's about where and why a sense of fairness exists at all and in this world and so on in this world in, to talk about the general society and about our deep human nature and the society in which we live. That's another one, and let's get into that. But returning to your question about writing, to my shame, I have to say, I'm a writer who committed crimes and went to prison. I went to prison and met criminals who had become writers, the hard guys, study and learning and practicing and writing and getting pretty good at it. And they were, they were developing and becoming good writers. So I had already been a writer. I wrote my first play when I was five years old. It was a very simple play. Uh, my mother, I saw my mother's list of guests for Christmas, Christmas dinner and the seating arrangement. And I looked at it and I thought, if I give each one of them a line, then, and they say it in consecutively, that's like a story. So uh, my mother said, do it. And I wrote down a line for each person. And when they came, they indulged me by taking the line. And later during the Christmas party, they were sitting around the table and they read their lines one by one by one. So it was a little play that I had written at five years old. At 16, I sold my first short story for money, and I've been writing my entire life, uh, from whether I was on a battlefield, in a prison, in a, I was kidnapped once and sent to, and taken in to a palace in Gujarat, and I kept writing there too. Uh, various different things have happened in my life, and I've always, the one consistent thread is that I was always writing, I was always, always making music and writing songs, and I was always creating art wherever I could from whatever I could find at hand. So when I was in prison, I was writing and afterwards, and really the, I was published while I was on the run. Um, it's, you know, if you spend 10 years in prison and 10 years on the run, that's the 20 years that should be the formative years for you as a writer. And instead, I spent them out of the, off the grid, either in the box or, you know, on the run. But I was published while I was on the run to, it's funny, it's a, that's a living proof and testament that I was always writing, even then in the mid 80s. And so you got published while you were actually on the run. Uh, was it under a pseudonym or under your name? Yes. I decided to use, it's in the Afternoon Dispatch and Courier. And I'll do a big up here. Anil Darko, um, who is a fantastic guy, a full-on Bombay guy when Mumbai was called Bombay, a brilliant scholar, a lovely man, erudite, charming and kind, the kind of man I wish I'd been in my life. Anil was the, then the editor of a newspaper called the Afternoon Dispatch and Courier. And um, he published five of my short stories under this. And I, I, of course, had to use a pseudonym. So I chose Nick Carraway, <laughs> who was the narrator in The Great Gatsby. It just seemed appropriate to me. So those stories are published under Nick Carraway. <laughs> yeah, I continue to learn more stories about you and blown away. And so one of the most remarkable things about Shantaram is the vividness in which you bring India, Bombay, to life. What does that city mean to you? Salvation. Hmm. It, the, it is a city with a big heart and big arms. It welcomes so many people, 5,000 new people every single week forever. It never stops. Sometimes there's 20,000 in a week. Every single week, 5,000 people wow. come to Bombay, flooding from all over the country. And it opens its arms and it throws them around those people and it finds a way. It's very hard to starve to death in Bombay City. You can be hungry, but very hard to starve to death because somebody is going to feed you. It may be a beggar on the street who's on a trolley with no legs and that trolley has metal wheels 
and his hands have become like the shoe leather because he rolls himself along the highway and on the roads and as he's begging with people. But that person may be the very one who, when you're down and out, says to you, Lin Baba, are, what's wrong, man? Are, kya problem hai na? And I'd say to him, this time I said, on this particular occasion, Devdas, by the way, was his name. God bless you, Devdas. He said, what is your problem, man? And I said, you know, are bhukleo, I'm so hungry, man. I haven't eaten all day. I didn't get any work with a tourist. I didn't have any luck. It was the time when I was quite down and out. And I said, I didn't get, have any luck, no tourists, no money, and so on. And he said, no problem, but I had tea And he took me with him to a late night restaurant and pulled out a roll of money that could choke a donkey. <laughs> and this guy on his trolley, and we had chicken biryani and we had everything that night. We had a feast. So that's a city. That's the kind of weird magical surprise that Bombay can throw up for you. And it's a big city with a big heart and big arms. And it will not let you die if you've got an inch of will left in your body. That tiny iota of will, the city won't let you fall. It'll keep you going. So it's a beautiful, welcoming city that offer, offers salvation for people, uh, for a lot of people, millions and millions of people who would be starving if they were elsewhere in India. <laughs> and so I'm curious because you mentioned salvation, yet the turning point happened in while you were in solitary at prison. And so going back to when I first encountered your writing of capital T, capital P, turning point, I was in the depths of my own addiction. And reading those words at that time, by the way, I had read Shantaram and I read the your descriptions of doing heroin and I knew that this guy, he, he had been there and I felt a shared sense of kinship. When I found this blog, I was almost like... <laughs> I don't even know if this is him. It's on the, it's repurposed on this site yet. I could feel it energetically and it gave me the idea, the possibility. It opened a door that, okay, you can't imagine reaching a turning point from my drugs of choice, which were opiates and amphetamines and many other things, you name it. But hearing that it was possible. And if a guy like this, who was a bank robber and a heroin addict and a, in the Bombay mafia could do it, maybe I could do it. And so I'm curious where does Bombay and in India fit into salvation along with then later getting recaptured and reaching that turning point? I think in a way, you, it's a good question. I think in a way you have to be saved in order to reach a turning point. You have mm. to be saved first in some way. It's usually love. <laughs> and in that case, it was a city that loved me and ah. that saved me. So if you, in a sense, the thing that broke me down from um, a very hardcore escapade armed to the teeth and ready to die on the spot. Then you escape from maximum security prison. You know when you go back, you're going to get flogged. You're going to get a hard time back then. From back the, the other inmates or from? No, the other inmates, you're a hero. <laughs> no, from the, from the officers. Oh, okay. This is going yeah. to happen. You, you, uh, you know, you blew it for them. Yeah. You got out at one o'clock in the afternoon over the front wall. Fortunately for me, I didn't go back until 10 years had passed and the entire prison had moved on and I was treated very humanely when I went back, very humanely, by excellent people, I have to say, people who became, a, st a lot of people are going to find this strange, but some of the officers I've known, the men and women in the different colored uniform, because we're in a uniform and so are they, we're in prison and so are they. Right. Those people, some of them are my heroes. They're the people who allow you to stay sane in a prison like that because they're the ones who stop others from excess. And they're the, they're the human beings on the other side that remind you that inside that uniform is another human being hmm. and they keep you centered. So I think Bombay, by welcoming this hardcore escapee exile who's landed in Bombay, um, I could have, if I'd landed in another place, I think I could have become even more violent, much more violent. And I was right on the edge of being very dangerous and uh, terrified that I was going to get caught or, and returned alive. I would, my preference would be to die on the spot than to go back. So I met India. <laughs> mm -hmm. And India took that and just didn't... I'll give you one small example. I went to a village in India, and if I, the people there in that village had not seen um, a foreigner like me for 22 years, 
It's remote. And the last foreigner who stayed with them was 22 years before, and that was a Belgian guy. And fortunately for me, he was a terrific guy. I never met him, but he was a terrific guy because they kept saying, oh, my God, the last foreigner we had here, so nice, and now we've got another one. <laughs> so he predisposed them to like foreigners. So people did. And uh, in that village, in that place, they couldn't read me the way an Australian could or a German or an American or an English person or a Frenchman or whatever could read me really quickly and easily. Am I in a bad mood? Am I in a good mood? Am I a dangerous man? Am I in a very wild mood now? Be careful of this guy. He's got a look in his eye that makes you wary. They couldn't read any of it. So they didn't, they were not acculturated to it. So everything I did, even if I got irritated, made them laugh. Everything I did was funny to them. I'll give you one example. At night, they would ask me questions around the fire because there's no electricity there. And they asked me one night, can we ask you, if we go to your country and have children, will they look like you or will they look like us? This is a very remote village. And I said, there's only one person who asked that. And I said, no, 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 they'll look like you. And everyone went, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> this huge relief <laughs> and so on. And, and they all laughed. Nothing that I did threw them off. Nothing could upset them because they couldn't read it. And what I found was I didn't need any of it. I didn't need the hard edge of saying, don't mess with me. That attitude, I didn't need it. And it didn't work. And <laughs> I didn't need it. So I became the kid guy. I had kids on my shoulders, on my knees, everywhere I went. If I went mm. to swim in the river, they all came with me. Uh, they would play with me and so on. And they said, this is this nice guy who plays with kids. And that is why they called me Shantaram, man of God's peace. If I'd gone to another city, I might have earned a different name. But in that, <laughs> that's what I'm saying about being saved. You find yourself where or if an experience that strips you away from the outer shell that you've put there to defend yourself against the world, any place that strips that away is your place of salvation. Wow. And for me, that was India. That's just wild. Yeah, and just hearing about how you had this edge and yet the people slowly in their own way without even trying broke that down. And Talking, going back to what you mentioned with the prison guards, I know that it took you a, a decade to write Chantaram. And I remember reading at one point that at one, at one time the guards had taken your manuscript and destroyed it. How did you, and yet you're talking just now about in part one of the opening lines of Chantaram and one of the key themes of the book is this idea that you can actually forgive your captors. And this is a, a deep, spiritual ideal that some of our leaders like Nelson Mandela after 20 years in prison, you know, forgave his captors and it's just forgave them, but have relationships with them. And so there seems to be something really deep to this notion of forgiveness and the freedom agency. So I guess my question here is how did that happen? Like on the one hand, you're saying that you were able to find solace and forgive your captors, but then also they maybe were destroying your book and you're having to start from scratch. How did that unfold for you? <laughs> well, um, you know, there's 250 officers and this was two officers and the vast majority were not like that. And in this case, the first officer, I never saw him again. He tore up a manuscript that I had and I never saw him again. And the second case I was working out of solitary back in the mainstream and working in one of the prison industries. And I came back to my cell and found my work, which was uh, mandated. I was allowed to have it and write the book by permission. It was, um, the manuscript was torn into pieces and it was flowing out of the toilet bowl. The thing is, um, at that moment, it's when it, there's a flash of anger when you, you want to go out and grab the guy by his lapels and shake him till his eyes fall out. But there's, you know, not that sort of moment of anger. Then there's that, if you've hit the turning point, that flashes away really, really quickly. And it's replaced with the thought, this is just to do something like that is not possible for me. No, I'm on a different path in my life. I have to be, I, I can't do that anymore. I have to do something else. I have to forgive that. I have to walk up and say, I forgive you and do this. I went up to the officer and said, um, I know it was you and I don't care why you did it. I forgive you. It's cool. I don't bear any grudge. Hmm. It's all right. You had to get it out of your system, something, and you did it. You got that out of your system. Cool. I'm cool with it. He put his head down and he said, I don't know why I did it. I don't even know why I did it. Wow. And I said, it's cool. And I walked away because it's prison. You can't shake hands or anything like this with the, with the officer. So I went back. Now, the weird thing is, or the good thing, really, the universal thing, and this is the path of forgiveness. 
Fast forward some years, I get out of prison, I'm doing my five years of parole, I'm writing my novel, I finally finish it, it gets published, it becomes successful, and I'm invited to go, wonderfully, to the Melbourne Writers' Festival. I mean, it's a thrill. I st I'm getting goosebumps now. At the first, uh, open, first time I opened the letter, and it was an invitation to come to the Writers' Festival, I, it, it was a dream of my life to be at a Writers' Festival and meet other writers and to meet people who love books and so on, which it was, it, it was great. So, okay, I get invited. I go to the Writers' Festival. It turns out to be really cool. And at the end of it, I've got all these people lined up to, to get a signed copy. I look, I'm greeting each person, saying, hi, signing the book. This is for Ruby. This is for John. And then there's, I look up and it's the officer looking at me, no holding the book against his chest. And I said, wow, man, it's you. And he almost flinched because um, I said, well, how are you doing? And he said, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And I said, look, um, do you want me to sign the book? And he said, I can't ask you. I tore it up. I can't ask you to sign it. I just can't. He was clutching it. He said, I just heard your speech at the Writers' Festival. And he said, I can't ask you to sign it. I said, come on, man, give me that book. So I grabbed the book and I signed it and gave it to him, and he started crying. He said, I'm so sorry. And I said, look, man. And he said, I hated that job so much. I've left the job right now. I'm looking for another position. I hated it so much. I used to sit in my car, hold onto the steering wheel until my hands cramped because I couldn't let go to walk in. The noise of the place, the clanging gates, the cr and I said, tell me about it because we had it on <laughs> our side too. And so on. I said, tell me about it. And he said, it just ruined me. I felt so bad and I left the job and I'm not doing it anymore. And he was crying and I said, I hugged him, grabbed him and hugged him because he's a grown man and there's a lot of people around. Hugged him in close and I said, hey, whispered in his ear, thank you. Trust me. This is a much better book than the one you tore up. <laughs> Thank you. And he said, seriously? And I said, whoa, it's way better. Read it, man. You'll see. And so on. And he had a smile on his face and we parted. Two years later, I had the great honor to be invited again to the Melbourne Writers Festival. And I happened to be in Australia, so I went. Mm -hmm. He comes up to me, shining, glistening, looking fantastic and really well-dressed with a lovely woman beside him saying, this is my fiance. I wanted you to meet her. I'm, I've been in computers. I'm, I've really become really successful <laughs> since I got into computers. I've developed this app. I've made a lot of money. Is there anything I can do for you? Here's this guy. Now that, of course there wasn't. I you said, yeah, give me another hug. And so on. <laughs> you know, invite me to the wedding. But this is the thing. This is the result of the path of forgiveness. Try to imagine what the other path would have been if I'd rushed out of that cell, grabbed him and had a, a fight with him. In the, can you imagine yeah. that path? Where's that going to lead? Yeah. I know that now. I just didn't know it when I was younger because I was too obsessed with myself. <laughs> totally. <laughs> that, that is so remarkable. And I think, well, for, first, I just want to understand how many pages did you lose? Because as a writer. 600. Oh my God. Wow. That's it, all right. <laughs> yeah. It was beautiful. And what it reminds me is that we're all living our own lives. We're all as complicated as just as anyone else, we all are struggling and we often, you know, especially in our culture today, it's just that idea is so lost on folks. And we, we tend to think that what people express as an opinion is a, the definitive essence of who they are as people or how they behave in one moment. And so there's a beautiful, a beautiful message there. So now going back to this notion of addiction, I'm curious, do you identify with that word? Of course. I've been an addict in my past. I'm not now, but I have been. Yeah. Yeah. And what does addiction mean to you? Basically, it's any habit that you cannot stop at will. Yeah. For instance, if I had, had smoke cigarettes, I can stop them if I want to. I'm not saying now, but if I did at any time in my life, I always knew that I could stop. In prison, um, you don't get them if you're in punishment. And hmm. I was often in punishment. So you just learn to do without it, and you just don't. I've always had that capacity. The one drug that I could not stop, I've always been able to stop with alcohol and say, you know what, I think I've been drinking too much, and not drink for a year, and not think about it. Other people are drinking, and I don't miss it. But heroin was the one that I could not give up without the intervention of you know, a whole state apparatus that said, you are so messed up, you need to be put in a box, man. Wow. You're so messed up, you've got to figure this shit out for yourself. So I sort of went that way. Um, I, you know, yeah. I think for me, addiction is anything that you cannot stop at will, mm. with your free will. Mm. And it's stronger than your will. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, in fact, nothing is stronger than the will, except the will itself. 
And addiction is not a helplessness in addiction. It is the willful use of the drug. It is the willful use of it. And that will to use it is stronger than the will not to. But the same will can be used to make you stop. There's no outside force forcing you to take that drug, if you know what I mean. No one's standing over you. Yes, you have pain if you stop. But don't think I'm a helpless addict. You are willfully taking it. It took me a long time to realize this and to say, you know what? I willfully took it to block out the pain and the stress that I didn't want to face right. in my life. Yes. I willfully took that. And when I was ready to face that, stre- that pain, that stress in my life, ready to face it and look it down and say, I know now what to do, I didn't need it anymore. And here's a message for everyone who has an, a, a heroin addict in their family or who is a junkie right now like I was. Yes, there can be a turning point in your life. And I'm so glad you mentioned this before. When you hit that turning point, and you will stay alive, you'll hit that turning point. And some hit it at 25, some, you'll hit that point. Stay alive. When you hit that turning point, you know who's going to be standing beside you? I am. Right? I'm going to be standing right there, right beside you. And so, so is Alex Olshansky. And so is every one of the others who's saying to you, it can be done. You can do this. When I did, when I hit the turning point and said, I'm no, never going to take heroin again, I'm finished with this drug, I, I remembered each person I knew who had been a junkie and who had overcome it and who was no longer an addict and never thought about it anymore and were fit, healthy, and leading productive, happy lives. They were standing right beside me in spirit because I kept thinking, in the worst moments, if they can do this, I can do this. All right? Yeah. So trust in yourself, have faith, stay alive. That turning point will come. And when it comes, you've got us standing right beside you. That reminds me of the story you told me of your boxing instructor, who, would you mind telling the listeners about that? Was it your boxing or was it your, uh, your boxing instructor who was, uh, he, he was super fit and older? Oh. My, my partner, yes. Your partner, um, okay. Yeah, yeah, he was a 60-year-old guy, Palestinian as it turns out, who had left, who was a part of the Palestinian diaspora and would, had found himself in Bombay. Like Jamaica, um, Bombay is a very welcoming place. Um, Jewish people um, and so on, and people from every other place have been safe there in Bombay and uh, in Jamaica too. And it's a very welcoming, open place. So he is a Palestinian, like, like many. There were at one point a hundred thousand Iranians who had, who fled their takeover of Iran and in the revolution in seventy nine. There were a hundred thousand people that that city just absorbed in one shot, and one one way or another they either settled there or, or found the way to go somewhere else. So he was living in Bombay, accepted by the city, and um, training and fit every day. He was a fitness instructor and security guard, and I used to train with him every mm. day. And I knew this guy for like a year and really well. And then one day, one of his friends said something about heroin. He said, yeah, yeah, in, back in the day. And I went, wait a minute, you took heroin? Thinking he must have dabbled. Because this, this guy was 60 years old and he was as fit as, he was the fittest man I ever met pound for pound. Hmm. He could literally box um, 24 rounds in a row, two minute rounds. He was, it was insane. He was a machine. And I, I said, oh, you took heroin like once or twice. And he said, I used, and he, he said, turned to his friend and said, tell him. He said, he was the worst junkie I've ever known anywhere. He would steal from anybody. He, could, he was hopeless. I found him, the number of times I found him in the gutter and so on with his pockets turned out and, people, and so on. And I looked at him and thought, this is impossible. And he looked at me and he said, no, man, this is possible for anybody. It's possible if you're lucky and you have, he said, I have people who love me. And when I said I want to stop, they helped me a lot. And so it's a kind of rehab, friends doing rehab for you. And they helped me, and the first month was hell. And then I, it got better and better and better. And now I've never looked back. And I feel nothing but heartache and pity when I see junkies. I think, oh, my God, I wish I could pull you out of this because I was there too. And so um, and so I've never thought, oh, gee, I'd like to have a taste or something, it never occurred to him. And at the time, I thought that was impossible. Now, I've been free of drugs for decades, from heroin, decades and decades, and never, ever think about it. I hmm. might discuss it, but I never think about it, if you know what I mean. It is possible, hear that, it is possible to reach a turning point with help, with guidance, with counseling, to get there with love, and get there and live a really happy, strong life. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, it's so funny because when it just reminds me of when, like when I first read your, your book and then came across the turning point, um, I wasn't nowhere. I was years away from actually reaching my own, but this, this idea of, you know, Joseph Campbell would call it guides in the hero's journey coming into our, coming into our paths and offering us that, that lighthouse, that example of giving us some hope. And I just think that that's so, that's really a beautiful story. So thanks for sharing it. And so I'm curious now because Shantaram ends up being a massive commercial of success. Johnny Depp buys the rights for the movie or the show at, at that mm-hmm. time. And then I know that you, and I know this because at that time when I was trying to learn as much about Gregory David Roberts and this turning point, mysterious fellow as I could, you had retired from public life or I, I, you were really hard to find. What led you to retreat? I was fortunate enough to meet a tremendous spiritual teacher. After years of searching for answers and even better questions, I finally met a teacher. I was always that kind of, that guy, back in the day when I was in Bombay, I was involved in crime, counterfeiting, forging, making false passports for the South Bombay Mafia and stuff. I was running around doing this, riding my bike, and with the other guys, one of the gangsters, gangsters are very superstitious, and uh, so they would come and say, I found this holy man, he's up in the mountains, he lives in a cave, he's brilliant, and he's really clever, and his wisdom is amazing, and he gave me this amulet, and now the cops won't be able to kill me, or the other guys in the other gang, <laughs> unprotected, and so on. You should go there and get one for you. And I never was interested in the amulet of protection. I didn't care about that. But the wisdom part, I thought, there's a guy in a cave who's got wisdom. So I'd get on my bike and go up there. And the only thing you can take to a holy man in India is food and hash. So I would take uh, with me a really nice block of the best hash <laughs> and a, a whole big satchel of fresh fruits, of every kind of fruit, and take that up and lay it at his feet and say, Baba, please accept this gift. And if he accepted, I'd say, can I sit here and listen to your darshan, your wisdom? Can, And he would say, sit, sit, and can I smoke with you? So I'd smoke with him and listen. So I, it was that, a person in a cave, or it was, they'd say, this is a great teacher. He has limited numbers of 300 students who sit with him on a Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and you can join in because you can take my place. I'd really want you to. So I'd do it, and I'd listen. And it never really changed, moved the needle for me. Yeah. It gave me tiny fragments, but didn't really move the needle until it m- met my teacher, and that was the turning point. Watching him, studying with him, when I ha- had to leave Bombay and go back, or wanted to leave Bombay and go back to look after my parents, who were both gravely ill, at that time they suddenly were diagnosed with serious illnesses, I left there and went back and said to my teacher, I'm going, and he said, take this conch. He blows the conch shell. And I'd watch him do it thousands of times. And I said, what am I going to do with that? And he said, put it on the windowsill as a decoration or blow it if you feel like it. Just pick it up and blow it. I said, but how can I ever blow it like you? He said, who cares, man? Do you think the divine cares how well you blow it? The divine cares that you just think to blow it. He said, think, it's up to you. So I went back and the, looking after my parents was the beginning of seclusion. And I thought, you know, oh, you know what? I'm very close to home, very close to mom and dad, not going anywhere much. This is the time Mm. for me to go off the grid and really go deep into this question of what does it mean to take a leap of faith, to be, and you'll understand this, to to be an agnostic um, all your life and a very (laughs) skeptical agnostic, ready Uh to rip any religion to pieces and so on, and an an, an aggressive agnostic. You know, I want to meet your, tell me about your religion, I'll study it, I'll read your holy book just so that I can pull it apart. I love it, yeah, aggressive is the way to describe it, because I was that guy to be like, oh, well, have you read The End of Faith by Sam Harris, and have you studied the reductionist argument well enough? But keep going. Exactly, and I was that guy too. Yeah. So uh, from that position to gradually through a whole lot of experiences that gradually move you to a point where you think you might be ready to take that leap of faith and to say, well, I don't know what you are, and obviously if you exist and you made this universe and all the other universes in the multiverse, you must be way, way beyond my capacity to interact with. I couldn't even look at you. So you're that, that, whatever you are. I acknowledge you. I say, yes, hello. And why is that required? Why is it required for me to say, I acknowledge you? Because I have free will. If I did not have free will, I'd automatically be one of your devotees and follow you and serve you. But I have free will. So I have to dial up 
I have to make the connection. I have to yeah. pick up the phone and say hi. And that's acknowledgement. And then there's surrender. And surrender doesn't mean lying on the ground and being kicked by God. Surrender means I now understand. Because I always thought it was that. I right. don't want to surrender to anything. And then I realize it's not that. It's not, you don't, what you're surrendering is the unnecessary, unrequired elements from your ego that are just not required to enter a spiritual space. Mm. To go into a spiritual space and offer your innocent devotion to whatever that is that's beyond this, you don't need your ego. You don't need your vanity. You don't need your pride. You don't need anything. You can leave it at the door. Go in, do your thing innocently, and then come out and put it back on again because you need some ego and you need some vanity and some pride in this world or you just can't, it's hard to function. Or so, you'll look pretty pretty messy. Yeah, you can end up like a hobgoblin and, you know, whatever. So I got to ask, Greg, because you mentioned we have free will and for the former intellectual atheist, materialist, reductionist in me, I feel like that's a, for some folks, that might be, well, you know, we can reduce our existence to the mere flutter of neural objects. Uh, you know, how do we know there's free will? And I'm curious to get your take on that. Yeah, um, it's amazing to me that anyone would doubt it. <laughs> amazing to me. It's like doubting gravity. Um, to me, it's demonstrably obvious. And I know the difference between someone who has motivated their free will and changed the course of their life and someone who hasn't. Hmm. Um, I see it every day, every other day. Where I, I don't see that many people these days, but every time I do, I see people who have used their, exercised their will to move the needle and change where they, the direction of their life, and people who are expecting fate, destiny, or something else to do it for them, and they're not exercising their will. So I know it exists. I can see it every day. I think um, for me, it's um, a bit of a rabbit hole to go down to, I've read all of the, of course, we've read all of the arguments, we've seen all of the science on this, and we see that hard science says there's no such thing even as, um, you know, <laughs> right. a mind. There's simply functions with artifacts that resemble such a thing. Uh, we have people who say that actions occur before you will them to act, to happen, and so forth. I think these are, personally, these are flawed studies. I don't think that's true. I think there's autonomic responses that occur before they're willed, but I think that there are freely willed actions that there are a different order of exchange between the, um, the synapses in the brain. It's a different order mm. of exchange. To me, um, free will is um, a given. And I, if you want to go into the, into the arguments about there is or there isn't, I think it's, it can be entertaining, but it's a rabbit hole because every single person who argues that there isn't free will exercises their free will every single day. <laughs> every single, it's like philosophers who argued with me over the years, who've argued the point rather, not with me, but hello, <laughs> who've argued the point um, that you cannot know an objective reality exists. You can't be sure that there's an external, external reality. It could be all an illusion and so forth. It's, for me, it's very simple. You go to the roof of the building, in the nine-story building, you stand on the ledge, and you invite all those who believe there's no external reality to step off. And then you go back down the elevator and have a conversation with whatever is left at the bottom. <laughs> because there is an external reality, and that's where they're going to be, at the bottom of it. And none of them are going to step off, because all of them know that there is an external reality. No matter how much they want to use an intellectual argument to say there isn't, they are not going to step off that ledge because they know there is such a thing as an external reality. And trust me, from my experience, I say trust me, it's a very Jamaican expression. We say, trust me, man. Trust me. <laughs> you're trust good me. at, you, you know, you're really good at impersonation. No, no, no. I, 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 it's my ambition to learn Patois and to be really good at it at a really small level that people only laugh a little bit. <laughs> That's like what I'd like to get to. But no, it, looking at this, you, you think, okay, I've actually had a three-hour argument, which I don't have anymore, or discussion, not an argument, three-hour discussion with a very intelligent person who was trying to convince me that there's no such thing as the free will. And then five minutes later, that, that person exercises their free will. <laughs> now, they would want to rationalize that and say, oh, no, no, what I just did was, you know, a step A, step B, step C, and a whole series that's got nothing to do with free will. And I laugh because I know they just exercise their free will. Um, you know, do you want to leave now or do you uh, leave in half an hour? Oh, half an hour. They just exercise free will to do that. There's, the taxi's coming now. Do you want to, I want it now or half an hour? Uh, half an hour. It's an exercise of free will. It's a choice made by you that, that determines the destiny of what's about to happen. 
yeah. that taxi driver is there now or is there in 30 minutes. You made that happen by your free will, freely willed choice. Yeah. Then you turn around to me and say, there's no such thing as free will. Yeah, I love it, Greg. Well, and, and thank you. Thank you for humoring me on that just because some of my readers are philosophy buffs. And, you know, I think what you just made clear is that you have thought about that quite deeply. And I appreciate that. Um, and I know other folks have as well. So just to be clear for, for some of you all listening, Greg first met, it sounds like this, a teacher, a guru in the cave, but then you met a second teacher who became your teacher. Um, um, I would have met personally perhaps as many as 40 gurus and teachers and sitting in a crowd with others, not actually personally meeting the person, perhaps another 40 or 50 over the years in India because they're everywhere wow. and they're pretty easy to find and hard to avoid, I would say. <laughs> um, and yeah. so I met many, many, many. And then I finally met my guy. And when I came into his temple, someone asked me to go there as a favor. And I said, okay. I said, look, I've met so many of these teachers and so on. And I really, they, they didn't move me. And he said, please come, please come. And it's a favor for me. And so I went. And when I get in there, it, it, there's 14 dogs, 17 cats, all roaming freely. Um, there are six parrots, um, massive fish in a fish tank, giant fish floating around this beautiful fish tank, a snake around Guruji's neck who's sitting in his chair, um, every other can sit, monkeys um, with baby monkeys, everywhere, all these animals roaming around freely, and two large speakers behind him with idols and this and that, like any temple, um, and two large speakers behind him and belting out Jimi Hendrix <laughs> nonstop. And he's smoking hash. And he said, welcome, welcome, take a seat. Very happy to see you. And so on. And then he didn't ask me anything or say anything. And um, I just sat there and said, thank you, and sat down. And after about an hour of talking with other people there, I mean, just listening, he turned to me suddenly and he said, would you like to know your sin? And uh, I won't go into it as perhaps for another thing, but, um, oh, well, I can just tell you. He said, I said, look, he said, would you like to know your sin? And I said, you can take your pick. I'm sorry about that, sir, but I've committed a lot of them. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no. These are crimes. This is not sin. Sin is a different thing. I said, oh, what is it then? He said, your sin is that you give your time, your energy, your love, and your money to undeserving people. And I said, as a liberal would, well-trained liberal, so how can we discern between the, uh, the worthy and the unworthy between, you know, the, and he said, don't be foolish. Please, don't waste my time. You know who is a worthy person to give to because they give back. Or mm. what you give to them, they share with others. They're yeah. givers. You give to givers. It's very simple. Don't, don't make this complicated. And I said, well, sir, but what if your instinct is to give even if it's to the worthy or the unworthy or whatever it is that you want to say, if your instinct is just to freely give and so on, as a liberal might, yeah. I said the same thing. <laughs> and he must have heard this a thousand times from different people. And he said, look, let me explain the sin because you don't seem to understand it. This person who is just taking from you, this unworthy person who is just taking, they will do that with other people. You have the right, the karmic right, to enter into an agreement with that person and give that person money. You do not have the right to empower that person to do the same thing to someone else. Then mm. you are involved in his bad karma. Uh, your karma is your choice with what you give to him. And that's just your foolishness in this case, because this person doesn't like you, respect you or whatever, and they're just using you. So this is your foolishness rather than your bad karma, and it doesn't help you in your karmic mission. But for him, taking it with a bad intention is his bad karma. But then he does it to someone else because you gave him enough money to allow him to do this. Yep. So you are riding on the back of his bad karma there. And this is your sin. And it blew my mind. And I went home. I said at the, after that, I said, sir, can I come back tomorrow? <laughs> can I come back? And he said, anytime. I said, can I come back tomorrow? And he said, of course. So I came back and um, <laughs> sat with him. He's wild. And I sat with him. And um, the next day, he said a sentence. Sorry, I'm taking a long time with this. But it perhaps put in context why I like him so much. Yeah. He, does, he has never once quoted a scripture. If I've quoted a scripture and asked him to interpret it for me from the Bhagavad Gita, from the Mahabharata, from the Ramayana, from the Vedic scriptures, if I ask him, please explain this line, it's always bewildered me, he will. But he never quotes from scripture. So it, uh, on the second visit, I'm sitting there politely watching, listening, and then he turned to me and he said, you know, you can never know the full measure of a woman's love 
unless and until you give her a place within you to rule unquestioningly. And then turned away. So and I said, excuse me, sir. And he turned back and I said, can I write that down? And he said, what? And I said, what you just said. And I said, of course. So I didn't want to be impolite, so I pulled out my notebook and I wrote it down. And then afterwards he turned back and he said, read it to me. And I read it back and he said, did I say that? <laughs> That's him. And it, I just love him for this. He throws these lines out, but everything he says comes from his own wisdom and from his own experience. He's not quoting scripture. But from that day, I started writing things down. And over the space of the next three years or so, I ended up with 20 notebooks of sayings of his that are sometimes really funny, sometimes really outrageous. And I kept writing them down and watching and observing. And that's how my relationship with him began, as a student writing down his sayings. And that developed into a practitioner myself of blowing the conch every day. I'm curious quickly, did you consider yourself spiritual before meeting Guruji? No. 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 And, which is so, to me, that is just so hard to believe because, not hard to believe, as in I don't believe it, but Shantaram is just infused with spirit, with infused with beauty and depth. And so help me understand that. My soulmate, A, we've been together for 16 years, really, in one way or another. We were best friends for nine years. My soulmate, A, has said to me many years back like now, you're a very spiritual person. And I laughed out loud and said, no way. I rob banks. I'm not a spiritual person. <laughs> I'm not. And I'm just not. And I never thought of myself as, I guess, and it always occurred to me, if you have a category, this is, again, the aggressive agnostic. If you have a category like spiritual, that means that there's spiritual people and unspiritual people. And I just thought that was unfair. I just didn't like it. It goes against the Democrat in me or the anarchist in me. So I said, no, no, no. And I rejected this concept. Um, when I met Guruji, he said, after, when I started writing these things down, he said, you know, you're a very, very spiritual person. And I laughed again. I said, hmm. no, I said, no, sir, I'm not. I've done a lot of bad things in my life. He said, how many spiritual people have done bad things in their lives? How many? Look it through up history. Look it up. Who became profoundly spiritual people. They were always spiritual. They were just on the wrong path. And he said, you're looking at the wrong pictures of your life. You're looking at the bad you've done. What about if you flip that? and only look at the good you've done in your life. Have you done any good? And I said, yes, I have. Okay, let's look what that picture looks like. Let's see. And let's add to that picture every spiritual person you ever met who liked you and gave you a little bit of wisdom. Let's look at that life. Hmm. Forget, forget the other one. Look at this one. Is that a spiritual person? And blew my mind because I'd never looked at my own life in that way. I'd always looked at the, the harm I'd done and the regret I felt for it. And he said, you know what, there's an... This is the thing. You were always spiritual. You were just on the wrong path. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It reminds me of Osho, the spiritual teacher, has a great saying about this, the attraction to drugs is spiritual. It's actually a very spiritual longing to fill a God-sized hole. I'm curious what you think about that. I'd say certain drugs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, certainly not heroin. Yeah. And not alcohol. Mm. I don't think alcohol fills any God-shaped hole. I think there with herb, with cannabis, uh, many, many, many people find that they, their ego dissolves. The hard shell of an ego dissolves a bit and they become warmer, friendlier, and more well disposed toward the world itself, to nature, more open to nature, more open to liking it. And so on. every time we look at some, a natural thing, any animal, any fish, <laughs> any tree, every yeah. time we look at it and sincerely, sincerely, say to that thing in our heart you don't just say it out loud you can but in our heart you are so beautiful mm. you are so beautiful it feels it <laughs> yeah it feels it there's no doubt about it so i think you know being attuned to this and being open to all of this that's a huge part of it <laughs> totally yeah and i think w w w you just seeing how you are with people i, I would describe you as a man of the people like oh. everyone yeah everyone you know you're friendly everyone everyone i've met here in jamaica is like oh greg like I, yeah greg he's the man so you were someone who didn't consider themselves spiritual yet maybe there's this thing just innate thing in you as in all beings perhaps it was before i understood that everyone is spiritual exactly and everyone is on the spiritual path it just takes you a while to realize it's right there under your feet and all you have to do is acknowledge and walk it. But everyone is. We're all, it took me a long time. I, 
to understand we're all spiritual. And then you end up taking a six year spiritual retreat and writing your latest book, The Spiritual Path. So you Can I just say one quick thing? Please. Sorry, to put it in a context for you, I said to my partner after three years of blowing the conch, I took the leap of faith and then became an active devotee, meaning blowing the shell every day is my way to show, to offer something, to give something to the divine. And I give my energy and I give my stamina. And when blowing the conch, it's arduous. It's, it, 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 it takes a toll on the body. You, you blow it till the last breath and so on. Then your heart is pounding and so on. And you, uh, so I use that as my opportunity. Once I said, okay, I acknowledge you. I surrendered the unrequired elements in myself. Take a time to get through that and figure that out. How do I do that? Now I'm ready to offer you something. Here I go. And that's called devotion. So I offered something in devotion. And after th- three years of it, I said to, to A, my soulmate, I, I, I've really got to compile these notes I've been taking and put them in a little book because if I had this, it would have been a kind of handbook for me <laughs> way back. And she said, good idea. Go ahead and do it. Very encouragingly, yes, she always is. And um, I said, I just think I need to do a little more. At the end of the fourth year, she said, are you ready to do that book yet? And I said, no, I think I need to do a little more. <laughs> and it was only until uh, the end of the fifth year of five years of doing that with sincere, authentic devotion that I felt ready to sit down and say, this is what. I, I had to walk the talk, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's not enough three years to say, hi, guys, here's this book from me. <laughs> had to, <laughs> And I had to be sure five years is enough to know you're never going to stop doing this for as long as the rest of my life that I have. I'll keep always keep doing this. I hope when I pass that I have the conch in one hand and my soulmate's hand in the other hand, and that's how I'd like to go out. Um, so it, uh, if you know that and you've put in those hard yards and done it for five years, I think then you're ready. I thought I might be ready at three years, then four. It was five years, and then I wrote it and completed a sixth year of, of that a seclusion and then came back on into the public world very happily. And this, the spiritual path is just a phenomenal description of the indescribable, right? Because at its core, and I know you would be the first to say this, that we're talking about something that just is beyond, it's beyond our understanding. And yet what you're able to do in this short little book, you describe the divine perfection and you talk about the spiritual versus the material reality. And I loved how you, for someone, a former agnostic, for someone who is still very much lives probably too much in the right side of the hemisphere and the logical thinking brain, that you're able to break down these these components. So maybe first, just tell me why the divine perfection? Uh, Just a little, you know, adjustment on what you said there. Sure. You know, who am I to define the God or describe God or say anything about God? And clearly, I, I say in the book, I don't know anything about God. And I don't. It's too big. It's too vast. Um, and so I would never try to say, here's my definition of God, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, there are some accepted characteristics um, of the divine. And for me, the word God is a loaded word because straight away you say God is like, who's God? Yeah. It's like guru. If you say, if you say uh, a guru, they say, who's guru? Which one? And if you say the divine, I think everyone, no matter what God they, they want to name, accepts that that means their God, so to speak. And it is because there's only one. If there is yeah. one, there's only one by definition. <laughs> the oneness of that, of the, of the divine, is a part of the definition that most people would accept of a perfect being. Another characteristic is that the divine would, does everything perfectly. It cannot perform, the, by definition, a divine entity cannot perform something imperfectly. So each thing it does is done perfectly, if it does anything at all. So if you think about that, and and without saying what does God look like, who is God, if you just say these are some characteristics attributed to the divine, you ask yourself, could God, this that people talk about, this divine perfection, be um, a destroyer? And the logic of this definition is that the divine couldn't, because the divine does everything perfectly, and if the divine could, but if it was in the remit of being a divine thing um, to destroy, it would destroy perfectly and there'd only be the divine. If it was poss- if, if possible for the divine to be a taker, the divine would take perfectly and there'd only be the divine. So the divine, by definition, seems to me, is a giver and a creator. Everything we see around us cannot be an expression of, of destroying, of taking. It's an expression of divine giving and so on. So... To, for me, just 
without saying God is this or that or the other, yeah. if we accept this characteristic, and most theo- theologians would, and people who believe in a God would accept, yes, God does everything perfectly. Well, for me, that means God is a giver. Is a giver. And God is creative, yeah. not destructive. And so if God is a giver, then the frequency of connection to the divine through this world that we live in, maybe the spiritual reality that is the way we interface with this amazing entity, this divine entity, maybe that's through giving. Yeah. If we give, we are whenever we give, we're operating on the frequency that this whole universe is predicated on. It's divine giving that expresses this. Mm. It's an expression of divine creativity. In other words, infinite creativity. So this is probably an infinite creation machine that we're living in with trillions upon trillions upon trillions of universes like this popping in and out forever once it was started. It may seem that entropy will contradict this, but we're talking about the divine. So we're living in a divine creation machine, this giant divine that goes on forever and ever and ever, and we're in it, in this thing. And it's an expression of giving and creativity. So when we are creative instead of destructive, we're on the same frequency. When we give instead of taking, we're on the same frequency. So when we go to the divine in uh, whatever that conception is, we go into a sacred space and we say, I am giving you this. Yeah. You are divine. You are beyond wanting and needing anything. You don't want, you don't need, you're beyond all that. But you made a universe. That's a truck going past, by the way, Jamaican truck. I'll give you some sound effects, guys. <laughs> yeah, there's a little, there's, it's now the, the frogs are going off too. Exactly. I'm definitely going to put one of those trucks into it. I'm going to put that into a beat. I'm going to sample that and I'm going to put it into a beat, into a house track. So if we're talking about this and we talk about when we're giving, uh, uh, we are in that frequency. When we are creating, we're in that frequency. If we go into a sacred space, and we ask for something from the divine, I don't think there's any doubt that we can open a connection. If we're sincere and authentic, we can and ask, please help me, I'm desperate. I think that's reasonable. But if we really want a profound sort of fiber optic connection, then we go there and give something and yeah. say, you, you don't need this, you don't want this, you're beyond wanting and needing, but you made a universe in which I'm free. Mm. I can give this to you, whether you want it or not, I'm free to give it or not. And I freely give this to you because I love you and here. And if I'm, if it's not good enough, I'll do better tomorrow, but I'll never stop. This is for you. When you come there to give without asking for anything in return, just give, 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 give from your heart and then walk away and it's done. And you know that, that you, you are connected, the divine is connected to you and you don't need to think about it anymore. When you do this, you open up a fabulous connection. And I think what you're describing there is the path of Tantra, of giving. And one of the things that you have transformed my understanding is around the concept of love. And when I was telling you a little bit about my my forays into uh, my limited understanding of polyamory, you kind of schooled me in the sense of like, well, wait, hold on. What is love if it's not selfless giving in the way that a mother would feed her children before she feeds herself, even when she's starving, doesn't have the money. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. And so this is, the, is you talk about gangster Tantra. <laughs> well, that's just me. I, I, in <laughs> explaining what I do, I'm not a Hindu. I have a tikka on my forehead. I have malas around my neck, which were wonderful gifts from my teacher that he wore from, for years and charged up with his energy. And charge us, every time I see him, I say, please wear this. <laughs> charge it up again for me and I put it back on. These are th- things from the Hindu tradition. But, and I was raised in, as a Catholic in the Christian tradition. I'm not in any religion. I don't follow any religion. I don't belong to any. This tradition is a tradition. I'm, I, I only have one really. And that's my teacher, so to speak. Um, putting the tikka was an instinct. I am absolutely sure that I did this in a former life. Yeah. I'm sure that I lived in India. The first time I put a foot on Indian soil, I knew I'd been there before. And I think a lot of people feel this because the homeland of a, a, a great spiritual dimension within us. And when we go, a lot of us, when we go there, it, we see everything. We're not blind. We see poverty. We see crowds. We see slums, but we feel an energy there that's not anywhere else. And some people don't. Some do. And so on. That, that response for me. So what I'm not, um, a practitioner of any religion. 
I blow the conch because all I know is I love Ma. I'm for Ma Kali. I'm for the mother of everything. Some people are for the father. Good luck. Great. Show me the, your God and I'll give my respect to your God and my devotion to your God's mother. I'm for the mother of everything. And that's us. So when I blow the conch, I'm just trying to connect with the mother of everything, the ultimate source of all things, and saying, I'm your silly little kid <laughs> standing in front of you, tootling away on my conch and so on. I'm just a silly little kid in front of you, but I love you, I love you, I love you. And, you know, you're my, you're my mother and I love you. And that to me has made a lot of sense. I, as soon as I got that connection, it made every sense to me. So that's what I do. I, I don't have a religion. I just love Ma, and I know Ma loves me, and that's it. That's enough for me. I blow my conch, and I'm done. And so the last question that I have on the spiritual path is you talk about there are quantum and spiritual realities. And one of the things that you've helped me understand is that they're actually not the same. <laughs> no, but not by any means. Uh, well, I think no one would would, um, would uh, be a hard argument to make. Uh, from my point of view, there's clearly a, a Newtonian classical reality that we live in, of billiard balls and planets and people. And within that, enmeshed within it, is another layer that when we, we drill, 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 drill down, we get to a quantum layer of atomic and subatomic particles and even exotic particles. And once we get to that level, the certainties that we have, which seem to be certain, nothing is absolutely certain in this world, but we know that if we put a ball on a table, on a billiard table, and we have a skilled player who hits it, there's a high order of probability it's going to go into the hole. When we get down to the quantum, that certain level of certainty it doesn't apply anymore, and we have an uncertainty, and so on. A diff so in other words, the rules change. Yeah. The rules from the classical go down to the quantum, and, or into the quantum, and they change. My feeling would be that if there is a classical world and a quantum world, there's probably also a spiritual reality as well. And the rules in that spiritual reality are not the same rules that would be in this physical reality we live in, just as the rules of the quantum are not the same rules as this world. Now, we accept that. I think it's reasonable to accept the spiritual as well, if you want to, that there's a spiritual reality right around us that operates on different rules, like karmic rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful. And yeah, just the last thing I want to add to that is that what maybe is the common thread between the quantum and the spiritual is light which is both the particle and the wave. Certainly the only thing that we can identify in our universe at this point as being a metaphysical object that is beyond the physical and a physical object at the same time is a photon of light. This packet of energy called a photon, this thing can, is a real thing. It's really there. It bounces off a mirror. We can see light bouncing off a mirror. We can see it interacting, focus the light rays with a, with a laser. So... It's really there, and we can work with it. But when we look at what it is, we end up with a paradox, because it doesn't weigh anything. It has no mass. So everything does, but it doesn't. It's, it has no volume. The forward dimension for a photon of light doesn't exist, so it, has no, it doesn't take up physical space. It doesn't have, weigh anything or have any mass, and it's traveling at the speed of light, which nothing else in this universe does. Not only that, you have quantum entanglement. If you get two of these guys and you separate them, one photon over here, you charge them up to the same charge and separate them by a massive distance, you change the polarity of one, the polarity of the other changes immediately. This is spooky action at a distance, and it's very difficult to explain and very weird. And it's um, an aspect of the photon of light that is beyond the physical as we know it, metaphysical. So a photon of light has metaphysical properties and physical properties. And that is one of the reasons why, to me, it doesn't make sense to be an atheist, um, with all due respect to my tremendously well-educated, well-motivated atheist friends. I love you guys, all of you. <laughs> and we've had thousands of discussions, yeah. and I love you guys. But the, th <laughs> but the thing is, it, to me, it doesn't make sense if there's even one thing in the universe that has metaphysical properties. Not, it doesn't weigh anything, it's not there, and it's a traveling at the speed of light, excuse me, and it's interco interconnected with every other photon all over the universe. If the one thing has metaphysical properties, it makes no sense to deny the metaphysical altogether. Yeah. That's enough for me to say, oh, I'll entertain a thought that there may well be a metaphysical. And as it turns out, a photon of light interacts at the quantum level and, it and atomic and subatomic level, and it interacts at the classical level. 
So it, it, it always, and it's involved in every function in the universe, the exchange of photons of light is fundamental to the operation of everything in the universe. So we've got this strange thing, a photon, that everything depends on it, everything works with it, and yet it's not really there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like God. Yeah, and I'm so, I'm so glad you introduced me to this idea and also, yeah, helping understand that it doesn't mean that we need to be light warriors in, in like the New Age folks who are worshipping light. Rather, we can just have the understanding that these things exist between both of these worlds. True. The quantum. Uh, it, it makes sense, I think, to pay respect to the source of light. Yeah. To pay respect to the sun and even its reflected form in, uh, from the moon. The sun, uh, in every great tradition, has earned our respect, our reverence. And when we forget that, close ourselves off from it and forget it, we lose connection with the ultimate source in this solar system of all our life and energy, yeah. our life-sustaining source and energy. So acknowledging the sun and giving respect is a big part of the Indian tradition every morning to get up on the Sun terrace. Sun salutation, Surya Namaskar A, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> and get out there in uh, Surya, one of the names of the sun, and so on, to give respect to the sun. This makes sense. Now, let's put it this way. I don't know how much time we've got, but let's put it this way quickly. The sun, let's suppose, using this terminology, using a Hindu way of thinking about things, the sun is a god. Yeah. And if you don't pay attention to that god and respect, that god will mess with you. Mm -hmm. You're going to get skin cancer. <laughs> You're going to get sunburn. Yeah. You're going to get something else. You're going to die of thirst if you do not pay respect to that sun. If you do pay respect to the sun, you'll have a blessed life. Similarly, time in this tradition is a god. Mm. Time has the symbol. The symbol of the sun is everywhere. The symbol of time is everywhere. It's called a clock or a watch or the digits on your phone. This is the symbol of the god of time. It's like a crucifix. It's like a cross. Right, It's like the Orm sign. Mm. This circular clock is like an Orm sign, and it is the badge of the God of Time. And all the people who are, if you like, devotees of the God of Time are people who have the God of Time symbol everywhere, in their house, on their wrist, and they're everywhere. And they are devotees of the God of Time. And if you don't pay respect to that God, time will mess with you, and your whole life can be destroyed before one minute late in a meeting, etc., or one minute late when your mum is dying in the hospital. These things can, one minute time, it can mess with you if you pay no respect to time. If we look at it this way. For me, I'm, my, my respect is to the sun. My respect is to time. My respect is to all the other gods, the moon. I respect you. But my devotion is to the mother of all of that. I love that. Yeah. And my, one, I just want to say, and I do want to move on, but... One of my favorite parts in the spiritual path was how you described when you're talking about the divine perfection, which you do, as you mentioned earlier, with a great deal of humility, which is like, hey, who am I to talk about this thing? We can't, I can't even look at the sun without going blind for more than three minutes. How, how could we imagine that we could understand what might be like a bajillion times bigger than the sun? Yes. Yeah. And that just, to me, there's something about, I think this is one of your gifts and it's being able to bridge build. And also, I think it's this gangster Shakespeare in you, <laughs> the person of you who was at its root, hardcore, a hardcore guy, you know, like a mafioso, a fighter, yet being able to like practically break down things for us to understand and maybe feel to in a deeper way, which brings me to the next piece, which is why I'm so excited that you're now bringing your gifts into the music realm, Thank which you. I understand you were, when you were on the run, you were also a front man of a band while Germany, in India, yeah. which is just, I that can't imagine. Germany, in fact. Oh, that's <laughs> Germany. Okay. Jeez. So music's always, and you, as you mentioned earlier, you're a playwright, you're always writing songs. So it's always been part of you, but now you're really dedicating your life to it. And you've produced some incredible albums. Love and Faith is just, when I first was getting your emails and saw that Drive All Night came out which is just this beautiful kind of like R&B reggae ballad of sorts. I was like, what? <laughs> now you're making music like this? <laughs> how, 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 did that, how did that happen? And, and for, it's talking about that creative wellspring that flows from you that I think, yeah, it's just hard to, it's hard to articulate, but you know, knowing everything that you've been through, how now did that flow into music? Well, it's always been there, and I often didn't have the opportunity to pursue it fully. Just one quick thing there, relevant to this. 
I talked about solitary confinement before, and it was largely positive for me, even though it's pretty hard. It, it is, but it was a positive experience. Here's something, though. Any singers out there um, who are listening, when I came out of solitary, I thought, you know what, guys, I just did push-ups for two years, I'm super fit, and I'm okay, and I kept my mind together, and I'm good, and I did meditation with the other guys down there, and I helped them, and I, you know, I spent my time well, and I'm ready for the mainstream. Uh, not, I'm not damaged. Um, if anything, I'm even better. No, it didn't take anything from me. I got back to the mainstream, and after I'd been there f for a few months, and Max, I wanted to sing one day. Mm. Um, happened to find myself in a corner where I could open up and start singing, and I tried to, and all that came out was a croak. <laughs> and I was a professional singer, paid to sing, and I couldn't. It was a croak that came out of my throat. And it was terrifying, because once again, it's unwilled. I, mm. My will was not strong enough to make me sing. Something happened. And it took me a while to realize, and every singer listening will know this, I lost the spirit in solitary. That's mm. the thing that, was, that I lost. That was the price I had to pay. And it wasn't until quite a number of years later, when I was working on The Mountain Shadow, the final draft, that my soulmate, came running into the bathroom, and, and I said, what is it? And she said, you're singing. And I went, what? And she said, you're singing. <laughs> and I hadn't even realized that I'd started singing again in the shower. And I got the spirit back. And I can tell you, every singer out there will know exactly what I'm talking about. You can have the best voice in the world. If you do not have the spirit, you can't do it. And if you have the spirit, you can overcome anything and move people with your voice. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really, one thing that I found once I... I ended up getting my act together and get, got sober and started experimenting and then eventually opened up my own singing voice. It's a cliche that everyone can sing and everyone has a voice, but it's one of these truths. And I've seen it time and time again. And I'm someone who never used to sing. And now it's just something that brings me such joy. And good, good. Yeah. Get it out. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So you're not just making reggae music. You're in Jamaica. You're making, you've played me deep house tracks of varying BPMs. I'm a former DJ. And so I can appreciate a good, a Plenty good of country in there. Some gospel. Yeah. 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 So are you just experimenting or what it, are you following the flow of the scent of your nose? How to like, talk to me a little bit about your creative process with, with when it comes to music. I have so many, um, tracks inside me that I d did not have the opportunity to write and to perform and so on to play. So I, I'm probably not going to run out of material for quite a long time. And I like, as an artist, I like to move from genres. I'm open to just about every genre everywhere. I love moving from one genre to the, to the next. So I just finished a, an EP called Deep Fit. Um, it's a bit like your Deep Fix. <laughs> um, it's called Deep Fit, and it's a fitness thing. It starts at 120 BPM, goes to 120, 130, 140, 150 BPM. And it's just get yourself fit, and jog to and run, run, etc. and the hardcore um, music that I wrote and created for that. I immediately switched to 85 beats per minute and very laid-back chill music. Yeah. Um, because um, after frenetically working on those tracks, I, I needed that break to go into something else. So I went into a kind of lounge area. Um, from there, the next lot that I'm working on are action tracks mm. and uh, the kind of things that you'd hear in, in an action movie. I've got five of them ready to go, and I'll move from 85 beats per minute to back to about 120, 130, 140 and so on. Uh, I like to switch genres in between. I love if I'm working on my own projects, like a, an album of my own writing and playing instrumentals and EPs and so on. I like to pepper that in between and work with Collaborate because that's where the real buzz is. It's great to create stuff on your own. It's so fulfilling. But the real buzz is working, collaborating with artists in a studio yes. and getting that you know hair standing up, goosebump vibe, vibe that only comes when everybody's hot and, and, and everyone's committed and it really flies. So that kind of thing, I like to pepper that in between. So work for a couple of months on my own stuff and then do three, four sessions in the studio with other sing with singers, musicians, get that vibe, and then yeah. come back and do this. And in between, guest artists will come to my little home studio here and record a track and, uh, and now and then. So it's, yeah, it's always been a part of it. Um, the, and the thing is, see, once again, you look at the people who did really well in prison, I look back and I see the people who uh, kept their humanity intact the prisoners who had been through hell, but they managed to somehow be cool and keep their, they were strong, 
you didn't push them around, but they, they were cool. They didn't hassle anybody and no one hassled them. They were artists, almost all of them. They were the painters, the guitar players, and the writers um, who had that other creative artistic outlet. Let's have more of that in prison. Let's have lots, lots more creative output than lots, less, and lots less destructive output from prisons and so on. But that, see, that's the, the salvation in music. That's the thing that can sustain you even when you're in a prison environment, keep you cool, keep you in a vibe where you, you are elevated from everything that's around you because you're in a different zone and so on. That, that's the wonderful energy that's in music. Yeah, the creative energy. And, you know, I don't want to make assumptions here, but you're over 60, maybe closer to... Uh, 70 this year. 70 this year. What, what's your birthday? Just so... The date of the birthday? Yeah. Midnight on the 21st of June. There we go. Excellent. So, you, you, I mean, there are not too many 70-year-olds who are collaborating with rappers you know we're here with the young man scantana scantana the man with the most grammar big up big up <laughs> yourself scantana i tell you anyone listening this is a brilliant brilliant artist go ahead please so i'm wondering yeah and just going back to what you learned from solitary and noticing the different prisoners and seeing just how vital that is to be expressing the creative energy moving that creative energy because you know you've got a lot of it <laughs> you told me you sleep, you, you're good if you get three to four hours a night. And Pretty so, much, yeah. It's it's usually enough. I might stagger a bit in the morning, but then you warm up by lunchtime and you're good to go. Really, I, I honestly think there is a kind of yoga you can do for your body, and there's a yoga you can do for your mind, so to speak. Um, if you can clean up your mind and get yourself to the point where you understand your strengths and your weaknesses. You look in the mirror and you say, it's not perfect, but I can make this work. And uh, it's, it's looking a bit shabby here or there. I better pick this up here and I better, better pick up a bit there, but I can make this work. If you, if you can like yourself, I don't think it's possible to love yourself personally. And I know that's going to come as a shock to people who say you have to love yourself before you can love others. I think you have to love others properly before you can like yourself fully. Um, to me, I, I think love is selfless giving. It's giving up yourself. So how can you love yourself selflessly? It doesn't make sense. Like, I think what they're saying, I get it. It's revere yourself, respect yourself, dig yourself, like yourself. Don't look at yourself and go, um, this is a failure. This is bad. This is not good enough. Look and get yourself to a point where you look in the mirror and say, it'll do. I can make this work. That's all you need in this world is to feel good about yourself. And then, Protect yourself, that good self that you feel good about, protect it by connecting with holy souls. Who are they? They're people who give. They give to you, they give to others, they're givers. Connect with them so that it becomes a giving circle. You give to them, they give to you, you give to them. With people who have good intentions, people who are fair, who are honest, who are positive in their lives, who are creative and not destructive. Look at the opposites of that. Unfair, dishonest, negative, destructive. No, no. Protect your, when you find your good self, protect that good self with a circle of good friends and good people who are all on the same wavelength as you. And then give, give, give from that circle. Give outwards and see the fun. See what happens to you when you give, give, give from that circle of good souls. Well, Greg, I want to be conscious of time here. We got dinner coming up. And I do just want to say that what you're not only making music, collaborating with rappers and many other Jamaican artists and many other artists and you know other artistic deals, but you're doing it with really honorable business practices, your spiritual path book, you're printing a copy that is compostable. You have an honest, fair, and tell me about the other acronyms because I'm forgetting it, that you've <laughs> implemented in your, in your company, Empathy Arts, because, uh, you know, I come from the, as you know, the world of uh, Silicon Valley and technology. A lot of readers will be curious to hear just a quick overview about why you set this up. I Thank you for the question. I um, come from a background in NGOs and so on, a lot of that. I've worked with a lot of NGOs over the years, many, many of them. And so I'm looking at, I've often looked at things from that perspective and I've often found myself in the position, gee, and the position where I am sort of shouting through the window at a corporation and saying, you should do this and you should do that. When I finally was in the position to start a small company myself, um, to, to basically, um, own and use my own work, 
I thought, well, I've got to start a good company. It's got to be decent. It has to be carbon neutral. It has to pay um, the required amount to make sure that it's clean and green. It has to be audited properly. It has, should have a glass taxation system where it's open to see that we pay our taxes. It should fully pay its taxes, and it should be an open system where you show that we pay our taxes. We should pay all of our social um, uh, fees that we're required to pay. We should ha have healthy, humane policies for our employees and so on. So we put all this together and we had a, a set of principles to be fair, to be honest, to be positive, to be creative. And when we set this up, we suddenly realized on the paperwork when we looked at it that technically it's a corporation. So this tiny little company that's just basically me and my, my little team um, is technically a corporation. And what I discovered then is that other corporations, the corporate leaders, when I got to meet them, were very interested in what we were doing. And they asked openly, is it working? You pay all your taxes, yeah. and, and you look after your people, and you're clean, green, and so on. And is this working for you? And we go, yes, it is. We, we're not looking to take over the world. We're looking to produce quali high-quality products. There's a banner on the book that we're bringing out, and it says, if you don't like this book, compost it, because it's fully compostable. We want to walk the talk and do the right thing, and so far it's working for us. And they listened then, whereas before I was shouting through the window and they weren't listening. Yeah. So be, trying to walk the talk instead of telling other people to walk the talk has been very productive for us. And I can, I can tell you, for example, contracts that we've spent money to get that are fair for both sides, our fairness contract that's fair to both, and it costs us a lot of money to draw this up. When I say a lot, it costs us money to do this with good lawyers, a fair, honest, positive lawyers, and so on. We put together these contracts, and our thing is every artist we work with and any of our contractors and, and consultants, if they want to use that contract, they have it free. It's them. If you want to adapt it, it's up to you, but we're saying here it is. It's free. We vest copyright with people. We try to make every single contract that we do a 50-50 arrangement and so on, that we're partners rather than a boss and you know a, a, an underling. We look at everyone involved in this as an equal partner in what we're doing. We have no hierarchical structure in our arrangement and so on. So it's not patting yourself on the back because, you know, we're struggling. We're a very small young company. But it just, I realized if I do this myself and start in myself, start in my own backyard before I lecture a corporation in what they should be doing, that might be the right way to go. And I tell you, since I did it, I've had so many pos positive responses from CEOs of other companies. It's just so rare to, to come across that. And mm -hmm. people are, there is a lot of talk to your point about carbon neutral or, you know, fair contracts, fair labor. It's a little different to actually put your bottom line on the line and put your money where your mouth is. And so I really appreciate that you're doing that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So, Greg, I have just three kind of rapid-fire questions that I like to close with. What books have you gifted to more people than any other? <laughs> That's a great way to ask that question. I'm going to keep that. you mind if I take it? Uh, well, this full is disclosure, I got it from, uh, I think it's from Tim Ferriss. He talks about how instead of saying, what's your favorite book, Correct. what have you gifted? Yes, it's yes. It's so good. Yes. Bless up, Tim. Really good. And bless up you for passing on that credit. Thank you. Really correct. Well, that's a really great way to ask it. And that narrows it down. Yeah. Um, it really does. I'd say there's a bunch of them. I'd say Orlando by Virginia Woolf. I would say it's a terrific short read and fantastic book. Massive imagination. God bless you wherever you are. God bless you, Virginia. Then I've got Juna Barnes' Nightwood. I, I think I must have bought 100 copies of that. It's an obscure little book. And people might scratch their heads if they find it and read it and go, what? <laughs> but I loved it. Uh, I think it's a writer's book. It's mm. beautifully written. She was a terrific writer. So that's Nightwood, a little book by Juna Barnes. Um, I rem remember that I had taken the Alexandria Quartet. I bought out every bookstore everywhere I went. <laughs> Whenever I went for a while. That's I the Alexandria Quartet? The Alexandria Quartet by Lawrence Durrell. And I'd say to anyone who hasn't read it out there, and the book was written in the 60s, so it might not be an, you know, in currency that, in conversation. It once was as one of the greatest literary works ever written. And this is the beauty of it. We all fade. Hmm. And we all fade away to nothing. Fantastic. <laughs> That's great that we do. So um, he wrote this book, and it's in four sections as a quartet. And please, if you encounter this book, read it in sequence. 
because at the end of the first book, which is riveting and beautifully written, you get the second book where a character says, oh, you think that's what happened? No, man, no, 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 you don't know the whole story. And you get the whole story again told from a different perspective with more information. It's brilliant. He was the first real postmodern writer in this sense, Hmm. um, coming up with this brilliant work. And it was his masterpiece. He wrote many great books, but that's his masterpiece of Lawrence Durrell. Of course, there are many other short books and brilliant books that just say, these days, who has the time? Anyone who's read The Great Gatsby, there's some moments in that. It's a terrific book. And I remember as a young writer, I bought about 30 copies. And I didn't have a lot of money. And I gave it to everyone I knew when I first read it. I said, you've got to read this book. And at that time, it wasn't so much. It wasn't on a curriculum at that time right. when I first read it as a kid. I'm, I think I was 13 when I read The Great Gatsby the first time. And I got with my parents together. My mom always encouraged me when it was uh, connected with writing. I used my pocket money. I wrote everything. And it must have been 30 copies of that book over time, whatever. Then uh, I'll just throw in there um, as another book. Of course, there's George Eliot, Silas Mana, fantastic book, Thomas Hardy, wonderful writer, anything from Shakespeare except the sonnets. Uh, there's anything except by the sonnets. <laughs> yeah, it's a different field by in a different set of work, and many of them. Hi, Bill. Many of them were groveling, as he would admit today. You know, they were really written in in groveling submission and, and subservience to a, a, a lord who was paying him the money to survive, and so on. So sonnets, not so much. A, f- a couple of them are absolute jewels, and they're the ones that are, or shall I compare the? These are always quoted. Yeah. But go into any play anywhere and just get into it. Shakespeare, of course. Um, and then, I mean, um, Adichie, oh my God, Chinamanda Adichie, what a writer. And then there's The Famished Road, and you go on and on and on. I must have bought 20 copies of that, and so on. Uh, there are so many great books. And another one that I bought in, in great numbers was Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by D. Brown. Uh, you'll have to go back to get that too, but you will cry your eyes out. It's fantastic. Bury my heart at Wounded Knee. And the last one I'll throw in there, and as a book, as a book I bought many times and recommended, is Ringo Livio uh, by Emmett Grogan. Amazing book by an amazing writer. Cool. All right. That was, Ringo yeah, Livio, wow. Emmett Grogan. I'll stop there. We could go all night with this. Yeah, yeah. That was amazing. I think just a reminder that uh, you're a true polymath. <laughs> and so... The next, the next rapid fire. What's one thing you wish more people knew or understood? <laughs> one? Yeah, just one thing. One? How strong they are. Mm, beautiful. How strong they are. We're all so strong. I've seen men and women rise above circumstances that I know would have crushed me. And I look and think, wow. How did you do this and bring your kids with you and survive them, put food on the table and do this? The struggle, uh, we all are very, very strong and we just don't know how strong we are. That's, I love that. So last question. If there were a mantra or a phrase on your gravestone, what would it say? <laughs> One would be, let me think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I love to sit back and consider things, and, and you'll hear it from me from time to time. Let me think about that for a minute, and, and I'll cogitate and then come up with some kind of answer. No, it would be love the truth and be true to love. Well, on that note, Gregory David Roberts, thank you so much for your time. It's just an absolute privilege to get to know you, to share presence with you, for you having me in your home, and I can't wait for everything that's to come. Likewise, I tell you, man, I wish, having come to know you over a few days here, I wish that I look back, and I don't mean I wish to say, oh, my God, I I wish it in a gentle way. I look at you, and I wish I were much, much more like you at at that, your time, in your time in my life. You're an inspiration, and I think that's why so many people turn to you for coaching advice and this and that, because you're walking the talk, and you're very sincere, you're very authentic, you really mean it, and it shines out of you. You're really, really clean, man. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing to see. So thank you. It's a blessing being with you. Bless up. Bless up, Greg. <laughs>